Well, next on the broadcast, President Bakane gives a strong push for developing Korea's fuel cell technology. A new industrial complex will work with the nation's top automaker in an attempt to capture half the world market. And in another move to innovate and deregulate new growth industries, the fintech or financial tech market gets a boost as regulatory barriers come down. And Greece's new anti-austerity prime minister wants to renegotiate his country's massive debt, but Eurozone nations and international creditors show no sign of giving in to the demand. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae-ri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with a major national push for green technology in the auto sector. President Park Geun-hye opened an innovation center in the country's southwestern city of Gwangju this Tuesday. That's right. And Korea wants the region to be a trend center, bubbling with creative ideas and vibrant startups for the future auto industry. Our Choi Yoo-sun reports on the new momentum to go green. President Buck on Tuesday launched an industrial complex in the southwestern city of Gwangju to help Korea emerge as a global leader of fuel cell vehicle production. The complex will work closely with the country's largest auto group Hyundai to develop next generation fuel cell cars, widely regarded as future eco-friendly transportation means in the developed world. Fuel cell vehicles, or FCVs, produce zero emission as they are run by electricity generated from a chemical reaction of hydrogen and oxygen in the air. The president said she anticipates a successful integration of Hyundai's capabilities to mass-produce fuel cell vehicles and Gwangju's advanced hydrogen technology infrastructure to produce innovation. Compared to electric cars, they can travel up to four times farther in distance from a single charge, with charging taking only three to five minutes. Hyundai Motor is the world's leading maker of FCVs, having started manufacturing the hydrogen version of its Tucson SUV in 2013. It aims to take up half of the global fuel cell vehicle market share by 2018. But other global brands are catching up fast. Japan's Toyota recently started selling its FCV, Mirai, at less than half the price, with hopes to sell more than 3,000 units by the end of 2017. Industry experts say the government and conglomerates should not only focus on R&D, but also investing in infrastructure such as setting up more charging stations to increase sales, which in turn lead to more investments. Another task is to find ways to bring down the sale price by nearly a third from the current $140,000 for a Tucson FCV. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. The idea of banking without the banks is uh, certainly catching on, and not only here in Korea, but around the world. And to keep up with this competition and breathe life into Korea's financial industry, Korea's financial authorities are promising changes. Our Connie Kim reports. The day when you can wire money to your friends after just a quick fingerprint or retina scan may not be too far away. Korea's financial authorities have announced a set of measures to make sure the fintech industry, short for financial technology, ensures the ultimate convenience. The transaction limit is set to go up, and the entry barrier is to go down. The idea here is to simplify mobile payments and encourage innovation in finance. In the bigger picture, it's part of the Park Geun-hye administration's campaign to deregulate and find new growth engines. The volume of mobile payments has been growing fast in Korea, too, with the total flirting with the $3 billion mark as of the second quarter of last year. And with digital wallets such as Apple Pay and Alipay replacing cash and credit cards, the global market is expected to grow fast. There are security concerns with cyber breaches at major government agencies and banks over the past few years in Korea. Authorities say they're planning to hold the IT companies involved legally responsible and increase the level of compensation if breaches occur. 
Now, after this latest move to cut some of the red tape, the focus is on how traditional banks will take the challenge and how new startups will make names for themselves in the new financial landscape. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Global oil prices have more than halved over the last few months, but drivers in Korea are not exactly enjoying most of the benefits. Our Kim min reports on why Korean prices at the pump are still lofty. Global crude prices have been on a downward spiral in recent months. However, gasoline prices in Korea haven't been falling as quickly as local drivers would have liked. Dubai crude, which accounts for nearly 90 percent of Korea's oil imports, traded at 93 U.S. dollars a barrel during the first week of October last year, but has since plunged over 50 percent to 45 dollars. However, at the pump, the average price of a liter of gasoline fell from about $1.70 to about $1.30 over the same period. This is only a fall of 18 percent. Why the big difference? Industry officials point to a string of taxes levied on oil consumption. Ex-factory prices of gasoline have indeed fallen in line with global crude prices, but consumers in Korea face transportation, road and education taxes totaling some 70 cents per liter, plus a 10 percent oil consumption tax. With the taxes largely fixed, their proportion in consumer gas prices has surged. The tax currently makes up over 60 percent of gasoline prices, up from 54 percent three months ago. But consumers aren't the only ones dissatisfied. Gas stations are also battling it out for customers and are doing all they can to slash prices, even if it is just by a solitary cent. Kim min Arirang News. Speaking of oil prices, the lower cost of gas may have contributed to an uptick in Korea's consumer sentiment, which rebounded in January after three straight months of falls. But we're still far off from enough data to see if it will last. Our Hwang Jie has the details. Consumer sentiment in Korea improved for the first time in four months in January. The Bank of Korea says its consumer sentiment index came in at 102 this month, up a single point from a month earlier. The figure, however, is lower than the level posted last May when consumer confidence was hit hard by the Seoul Ho ferry disaster. Experts also say that the uptick cannot be interpreted as a strong sign of a solid recovery momentum. It's more like the index is reflecting people's hope over the new year that things are going to be better with the drop in global oil prices, giving more leeway for spending. The central bank also says that it's about time for a rebound, adding the index, which reflects consumers' overall economic outlook, has never fallen for three or four months in a row except in cases when there was a major shock in the economy. Still, a reading above 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. In fact, there are conflicting signs that the country's exporters are not faring well. A new survey of around 900 exporters shows that more than a third of them are skeptical about the economic conditions this year. Less than a quarter said they felt positive, while the rest said the conditions should be manageable. Now, all eyes are on the new economic data for the first quarter this year, which will give a clearer picture of whether the domestic economy is on a stable recovery track. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. It's getting harder for people to move up the income ladder here in Korea. A recent study shows that the poor are staying poor while the rich are staying rich. Our Kim ji explains how it's getting tougher to climb up. It's getting more difficult to climb up the social economic ladder in Korea, particularly for those living under the poverty line. A study by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs shows that a mere 23 percent of them escaped poverty in 2014. That's the lowest rate of escape since the first study in 2006. The percentage of people who went straight from the lowest income bracket to the highest without spending time in the middle class increased by a mere 0.3 percent an eighth of that recorded eight years ago. The study also says the rich are likely to stay rich. 
More than 77 percent of those in the high income bracket in 2013 remain in the same income bracket in 2014. On the other end of the scale, the number of people who filed for bankruptcy and signed up for debt workout plans hit a record high of 110,000 last year, a near 5 percent increase from a year ago. The study blames labor immobility for the lack of movement across the social economic ladder. 83 percent of those with temporary positions in 2013 said they were unable to find a full-time job in 2014. Nearly 93 percent of those with full-time jobs kept their positions during the same period. Kim Jung, Arirang News. The United States has once again expressed support for Korea in its diplomatic row with Japan over history. U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert said Washington understands that Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women is a highly charged issue. Our Hwang Sung-hee tells us more. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's seemingly unapologetic attitude about Japan's wartime atrocities is drawing concerns from the United States. In an interview on Tuesday, U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert recognized the gravity of the so-called comfort women issue. Um, the President of the United States, when he was here in April, uh, called the, the treatment uh, shocking. Um, so we, we, um, we, we know that it's, it's tough and a very emotional issue. The unresolved matter of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women has been the biggest thorn in Seoul and Tokyo's bilateral ties. Abe stirred things up this week by hinting that his so-called Abe statement may drop words of apology used in statements by his predecessors. He is set to unveil it this summer to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Lippert expressed U.S. support for the existing Kono and Murayama statements and addressed President Park Geun-hye's recent efforts to mend ties. We found that uh, President Park's recent proposal of a trilateral foreign minister meeting uh, as a constructive step that could possibly lead to a trilateral summit. The ambassador welcomed Seoul's efforts to improve relations with Pyongyang, saying the U.S. has no concerns with the speed or scope of the inter-Korean dialogue proposed by President Park. And when will Washington be ready to engage with the communist state? That, he said, is when the North is willing to take steps for a complete, irreversible, verifiable denuclearization of the Korean peninsula. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has vowed his support for inter-Korean talks and projects. Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se held one-on-one -on -one talks with the U.N. chief on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. During this meeting, Mr. Ban conveyed his hopes and willingness to help find a breakthrough between the two Koreas. He also called on Seoul to join global initiatives on climate change and sustainable development and expressed gratitude for Korea's active role in the global fight against Ebola. North Korea has launched a military exercise in a show of anger towards the United States and South Korea. The state-run Korean Central News Agency reported that its leader Kim Jong-un conducted his frontline troops winter drill, saying that a powerful offensive means a rock-firm defense. The agency did not specify where or when the drills were held. In a separate report, it condemned South Korean activists for their latest leaflet launches and criticized U.S. President Barack Obama's recent a remark on his belief that the spread of the internet will eventually lead to North Korea's collapse. Maverick investor Jim Rogers has long agreed with President Bakune that a unified Korea could be a literal jackpot. Arirang News recently spoke with Rogers on how he sees the investment prospects progressing. Ponsawa has more. Reunification of the two Koreas would mean a lot for the people of South and North Korea. But for foreigners, ample opportunities to make big bucks, at least for investors. Financial experts from around the world see tremendous business potentials in the northern part of the peninsula once unification is achieved.
Jim Rogers, the chairman of Rogers Holdings, a legendary investor with a minimum of 300 million U.S. dollars in assets, voiced his willingness to invest all of his assets into North Korea if the two Koreas are unified. You're going to have a country of 75 million people right on the Chinese border, vast natural resources in the north, huge amounts of cheap, disciplined labor in the north. In the south, you have lots of capital, lots of brains, lots of management ability. It's going to be unbelievably exciting. How big will the economy be? I have no idea, but it's going to be a lot bigger than the combined economy is now. Rogers says while Japan is not fond of the idea of a unified Korea, which will emerge as its strong competitor, China and Russia are already very interested in investing in the North. They've just built two new docks in Razoon. If you look at a map, the Razoon is the northernmost ice-free port in Asia. So you put goods into the port, put them on the train, and Russia has just rebuilt the railroad into Razoon. So that's going to be one good that they want it to be, and it will be, a transportation hub going forward. But they've got huge minerals. In 1972, North Korea was richer than South Korea. It was vast natural resources. They still have them. They've been ruined by the communists. So you go there, open yourself a mine. Silver, coal, iron ore, there are plenty of things you can do there. The only item the American businessman has purchased so far is North Korean coins due to the many sanctions imposed on the North by the U.S. But Rogers has hope for future investments after meeting with people in the North Korean regime. When asked about which sectors should be targeted, Rogers says underdeveloped North Korea basically needs everything. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And in order to prepare for unification, South Korea hopes to establish an inter-Korean broadcast exchange support center. The Korea Communications Commission says the telecom regulator is drawing up a long-term plan to increase interaction with Pyongyang. Citing how similar activity helped Germany in its reunification, the KCC reports that it could begin with small steps like personal or academic exchanges in a third country. On another note, the commission also promised support for exporting broadcast content by making use of recently signed free trade agreements. The agency is especially focused on ASEAN and China finalizing terms for co-producing content with its Chinese counterpart. With a new anti-austerity prime minister leading Greece now, the country faces the daunting task of renegotiating its massive bailout loans. With more, we turn to Son Jung-in at the News Center. Jung-in, it looks like Athens can expect tough negotiations ahead. Yes, as the European Union comes down on Greece, there's a question of whether their differences will eventually push the country out of the Eurozone. Our Shin Se-min has the details. With radical leftist Alexis Tsipras sworn in as Greece's new prime minister on Monday, the debt crippled nation is demanding its debt be cut as part of a plan to renegotiate the bailout package. Tsipras is calling for forgiveness of nearly a third of the country's more than 300 billion U.S. dollar debt. But nations in the Eurozone and international creditors showed no sign of giving in to the demand. The new Greek leader stands directly goes against Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel, a chief advocate of the austerity program. A spokesman from the German government urged Greece to fulfill its commitments to its European creditors, a sentiment that was backed up by the group of Eurozone finance ministers. Echoing the sentiment, the Eurogroup chair said Eurozone financial leaders are ready to work things out with Greece, but that there is very little support for a write-off in Europe, and Eurogroup members should abide by the rules and commitments. Uh, so there is still a major work to be done uh, in which we will support the Greek government uh, on the basis of true cooperation uh, and commitment. Uh, and that's the basis on which we will work. The big differences between the new Greek leader and the creditors fuel concerns of the so-called Grexit, or a Greek exit from the Eurozone. The majority of the Greeks and Syriza have said that they want to stay in the Euro. Since I'm in, Arirang News.
And the top ratings agency has slashed Russia's credit grade to junk status for the first time since 2004. Late Monday, Standard & Poor's downgraded its rating from triple B- to double B+, which is below investment grade. The agency cited the country's weakened economic growth prospects hit by Western sanctions over the Ukraine crisis and a sliding rubble. After the cut, Russia's finance minister, who criticized the agency's decision as a show of excessive pessimism, announced an anti-crisis plan that will freeze the level of spending. The plan also sees the budget returning to a surplus by as early as 2017. The Russian military says it will withdraw from search and recovery operations for Air Asia Flight 8501 that crashed into the Java Sea, killing all on board. On Tuesday, the chief of the Indonesian Armed Forces ordered the military teams involved in the efforts to pull out, citing rough weather and poor underwater visibility. So far, officials have managed to recover 70 bodies, leaving 92 still unaccounted for. Meanwhile, Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee will submit its initial findings on the crash this week to the International Civil Aviation Organization. And over in South America, Argentine President Cristina Fernandez has announced plans to dissolve the country's intelligence agency. In a nationally televised news conference late Monday, President Fernandez said she would draft a bill to set up a new body by the end of the week, saying the intelligence service has kept much of the same structure it had during the military government. The move comes after the mysterious death of Prosecutor Alberto Nisman in January, just before he was due to testify against the senior government figures, including Fernandez, over allegations they were involved in a plot to cover up Iran alleged role in the 1994 bombing in Buenos Aires. Fernandez, meanwhile, said the scandal was linked to a power struggle inside the intelligence service itself. And that wraps up our look at international stories we're following at this hour. Hello everyone, I'm Steven Che with The Sports Brief. Now in the latest regarding Korea's top swimmer Park Tae-hwan and his failed doping test, high levels of testosterone were found in his system. So how exactly did it get there? Park's increased testosterone levels were caused by injections containing the banned substance Nibido administered by a hospital which offered him free chiropractic care. Investigators said that Pak claimed he didn't know about the substance and that the hospital's doctors testified they weren't aware it was prohibited. But whether it was by accident or because of hospital negligence, the 25-year-old faces penalties from the world swimming body, FINA, which include stripping him of the six medals from the Asian Games last year, along with a suspension. And putting that aside, let's head to the KBL Hardcourt as the LG Sakers hosted the Mobis Phoebus. And the visiting Phoebus dashed out the gates, but the Sakers evened it up by halftime. Fast forward to the fourth quarter, Davon Jefferson was red hot, dropping 15 points there. He finished with 37 on the night as the Sakers seized their ninth win in a row. And moving on, Australia is headed to the Asian Cup Finals after defeating the United Arab Emirates in the semis. The home team wasted no time as Trent Sainsbury netted the bouncing header in the third minute. And later on, Jason Davidson went to the far right post just 11 minutes later, making it 2-0. Australia held on to win and booked the spot into the finals for the second straight tournament. There, the hosts will face South Korea for Asian Cup glory. Will Australia become the first-time champions, or will South Korea hoist their first trophy in 55 years? The Asian Cup final kicks off on Saturday at 6 p.m. Korea time. Finally, bad news for L.A. Lakers fans as Kobe Bryant is headed to surgery to repair a torn rotator cuff in his right shoulder, and he may be out for the season. 
The Lakers say they'll issue a timeline for his return after his surgery on Wednesday, but head coach Byron Scott, as well as basketball experts, think he'll be sidelined for the season. It's a huge setback for the 19-year Laker veteran who's planning to retire after next season. And that wraps it up for sports. Your weather's up next. Have a good night. Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather outlook. We begin with news of snow showers falling on the eastern coastline where a pre-heavy snowfall watch has been issued. And areas there will get a mix of snow and rain through Wednesday as the morning lows in most regions are set to plunge. Other than that, the fine dust index could rise above normal levels in some regions. Taking a closer look, up to 10 centimeters of heavy snowfall is forecast for the coast of both Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces and rain will accompany the snow. 5 to 10 millimeters of precipitation is expected for most areas along the east coast. And looking ahead, more showers should, should fall, that is, down south from Thursday through Friday. Moving on to tomorrow's readings, Seoul hits a high of 1, Gwangju hits 4, Busan reaches 8. Meanwhile, Jeju gets up to 6, Dokdo hits 1, Mount Kumgang minus 6. Those are the updates I have for you now, but more coming up after the night. And that's primetime news for this Tuesday. I'm Kang Tiddy. Thanks for watching. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great evening. We'll see you soon.